Chapter 3 The Elves Create Their Worst Explosion Yet A voice was what brought Jamie out of his sleep. Multiple voices, actually. They sounded familiar, but he knew it wasn't his mother or Sophie or any of his friends. He couldn't remember where he was. He couldn't even remember going to sleep. He didn't feel scared, because although he couldn't immediately place the voices, he knew them as kind voices. He didn't want to open his eyes just yet. For some unfathomable reason, touched it. You didn't see what I saw, but why would you touch it? Fanny, keep your voice down. We need to find it, the whatever it was. And to what? The thing looked like, like, well, it didn't look like anything. But catching it would be like trying to catch air with your hands. And what about Jamie? Jamie held his breath. Suddenly, as the last voice spoke, all the other voices fell into place. That was Jack, and the other voices belonged to Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, and Santa. Were they in this room again? Jamie wanted to open his eyes now, but he stealthily kept them shut. Jamie will be fine, Jack, Tooth said softly. I, I'm not sure what happened, but he just passed out. He'll wake up soon enough, no harm done. Right, Sandy? There was a moment of silence, followed by Jack's shaky sigh. No harm done, he asked with a joyless chuckle. I could have, I should have. He trailed off, and there was silence again. Jamie waited, then dared to crook one eye open. Jack was sitting in a chair in front of him, but his attention was directed to Sandy, whose dream sand was flickering above his head to form rapidly changing images. Jamie couldn't say he understood much of it, but the Guardian seemed to. I had a dream about it. Jackson said. It was a memory. The first time I saw it, the cave collapsed before I got close to it. Sandy frowned before the picture of what might be a rainbow, followed by a question mark, appeared over his head. Blue, Bunny and Jack replied in unison. And Jack started but stopped himself as if he regretted saying anything. The guardians gave him questioning looks, and Jamie saw his lower lip tremble a bit when he spoke again. I saw something within it. Images. I saw someone in there that I... I used to know. The last part came out flatly, and it was clear that he didn't want to elaborate on that. Sandy scratched his chin, then nudged North. A golden book appeared over his head, and North nodded. Do you think you can find it in the library? Tooth asked, her hands clasped anxiously together. Sandy gave a determined nod. It was clear they were about to leave. Jamie pushed himself up, and the movement caught Jack's eye as he quickly turned around. Jamie, he breathed out in relief, sliding out of his chair to kneel beside the couch. The other guardians stopped in the tracks as well, all their eyes fixed on Jamie with obvious worry. Jack too, but he tried for a smile, as if Jamie hadn't seen him absolutely dejected just seconds ago. He fooled no one. How do you feel? Jamie didn't immediately answer, because he was distracted by something else. Now that he was sitting, and Jack wasn't partly obscuring his vision anymore, Jamie could see most of the room. The room was built in dark wood, and there was a big fireplace, with some embers glowing in the ashes. There were Christmas decorations on the walls, even though Christmas was long over. And all the guardians were here. Jamie felt his mouth fall open. Surely this wasn't. Where are we? He asked, looking at each of the guardians' faces. Jack's smile turned a little shaky, as if he was holding back a laugh. Where do you think we are? He asked back. Jamie stared at him before he threw off the heavy blankets he was covered with and got up. Oh, careful, Jack said, moving out of the way. I feel fine, Jamie replied distractedly and looked around. He gave a shocked gasp as he took in the rest of the room. There was a huge globe with glowing lights on it, hovering in mid-air and in the center of a gigantic open space. Jamie walked up to it, placing his hands on the railing at the edge of the floor. Standing on his toes, he peeked over it. He couldn't believe his eyes. He even tried pinching himself, but he was definitely awake, and he really was here. Jamie looked up at Jack as he came to stand beside him. Santa's workshop, he said, his voice reduced to an odd whisper. Jack's smile was bright with amusement. A bit different than you imagined, maybe, he asked. Jamie knew his mouth was still hanging open, but he couldn't help it. Are we at the North Pole? he asked, no much louder than he'd intended. For real? For real, Jack confirmed with a laugh. No way, Jamie brought a hand to his head. Am I dreaming? No, I already pinched myself, I'm not dreaming. He turned around and saw the other guardians talking quietly among themselves, while still keeping an eye on Jack and Jamie. Jamie's face split into a grin and he ran back over to them. You're all here, 
he exclaimed, unable to contain his excitement. Then he remembered something else. Wait, why am I here? Uh, North started, looking to the other guardians. Tooth visibly hesitated before she flew closer to Jamie, landing gently on her feet. Don't you remember, Jamie? she asked. What happened before you got here? Jamie's smile gave way to confusion. He faintly registered Jack coming up beside him again. He frowned. Before, he said, looking for the answer in the faces of the guardians. Then his eyes landed on Bunny, and he blinked. He, Bunny, and Jack... Jamie had been playing hide-and-seek, and Jack... Jack was sick? He looked up. How do you feel? He asked Jack. Jack's brows rose, as if Jamie had spoken a different language. How do I feel? He asked back. You're sick, Jamie said. Oh, that... Jack smiled, shaking his head. I'm fine, Jamie, don't worry about that. Are you sure? Jamie probed. He didn't want Jack to pretend just because Jamie was younger or because he felt he needed to act strong as a guardian, even if he did look a little healthier now than he had earlier. When Jack nodded reassuringly, Jamie looked down at the floor. Wait, he started. There was the cave, and then... His eyes widened, snapping up to Jack and Bunny. What about the crystal? What happened to it? North smiled. See, he is completely fine, he said, then winced as Bunny tried to subtly elbow him. Jack, Tooth said, glancing once at Sandy, maybe you should update him while we... She trailed off. You mean I get to skip out on reading a bunch of boring old books? Jack said with a snort, tousling Jamie's hair. If you're sure you feel fine, why don't you show you around, huh? The promise of seeing everything Jack had told Jamie about Santa's workshop was more than enough to make him forget about his questions. At least for now. Yes, he said, clapping his hands together. Jack grinned and led the way. They had just rounded a corner to go down a set of stairs when a ball of blue and green sprang in front of Jack's face, making him stop in his tracks. Oh, hello, he laughed. Want to come with us? There was a string of chittering before a tooth fairy came to fly in front of Jamie's face as well. Jamie straightened his back. Last Easter, he hadn't had much of a chance to talk to the Tooth Fairies, or at least attempt to communicate with them. Jack had assured him they were nice, though. Hello, uh... Baby Tooth, Jack said. Baby Tooth, Jamie repeated, smiling at the fairy in a way he hoped wasn't too uncertain. Baby Tooth's chirping sounded happy, at least, and Jamie let out a small, nervous laugh, glancing helplessly at Jack. Uh, sorry, I don't understand you. Baby Tooth gave a soft chirp, smiled and shrugged, then flew over to sit on Jack's shoulder. Jamie took it. She didn't mind. I didn't at first either, Jack said as they continued downstairs. But they've been pretty adamant about making me understand their language. Seeing the way Baby Tooth smiled up at Jack somehow made it easy to guess why that was. Do you understand them now? Jamie asked, studying the fairy curiously. Jack grimaced slightly. Well, there's been a few misunderstandings here and there, but they're pretty great at teaching languages. Not surprising, considering tooth omnilingualism and all. Omni what? Mm, she can communicate in every language, Jack replied as they walked out of the corridor. Not sure why the rest of us don't have that. Hey, wait up! <laughs> Jamie completely forgot about his manners as they walked out into the workshop, where he had eaten elves for all working tirelessly. I would have thought they'd slowed down now that Christmas was over, but it didn't seem like it. Well, for all Jamie knew, this was nothing compared to how busy it would be right before Christmas. Do they really need to prepare all here? Jamie asked, awestruck. I thought you said the Yetis did all the work? But the elves... He stopped talking when he saw one of the elves jump from a tall shelf with an obviously faulty parachute and promptly fell to the floor with a quiet thump and a loud jingle. Jamie cringed. Oh... Jack snorted and walked on. They're fine, he assured him. And yeah, it seems they do. Sounds exhausting to work all year round, but it looks like they all enjoy doing what they're doing. Baby Tooth made an approving sound. Wow, Bunny must be really busy now then. It's not that long until Easter. I think he said something about perishables at some point, so all the work has to be done just a few weeks before Easter. Jamie stared at him. No way. Jack smiled lopsidedly before he rolled his eyes. But don't bring that up around either of them. They bicker like little kids about it. N no offense. 
Jamie slapped his arm, and Jack laughed. They walked around the workshop for a long time. Jamie didn't know for how long, because neither he or Jack were wearing a watch, but either way, Jamie didn't feel the need to check the time. He didn't want this to end. He wasn't Santa's workshop. No matter how much time he spent here with Jack, trying out the toys, speaking to the elves and yetis, or trying to at least, and just taking it all in, it was hard to believe that he wasn't just dreaming. Baby Tooth flew around them, making cheerful noises whenever Jamie tried to speak to her. Jamie didn't understand a word or sound, but Jack worked somewhat as a translator. Sometimes she would disappear, and upon asking why, Jack said the Tooth Fairies were always busy collecting teeth, and Baby Tooth was probably checking in with Tooth every now and then, in case she needed her help. Jamie was astonished that he even got to hear about all this stuff. All this magic, and he, out of every kid in the world, got to be a part of it. It was almost sad, because he knew that anything in his life brought on after this would surely pale in comparison. The only thing keeping him grounded was the way Jack zoned out every time he thought Jamie wasn't looking, his lips pursing and brows furrowing. Jamie tried not to think too much of it, because it wasn't the first time he'd caught Jack like that. He recognized it, because his mom did the same thing, hid away her sadness for his and Sophie's sake. He wondered if he should ever ask about it, or if Jack preferred to keep those thoughts to himself. But this was different. Not only had Jack just been, or was he still, sick, but Jamie still didn't know what had happened after they'd found that crystal. Obviously it was something important, because otherwise they wouldn't have brought him to the North Pole, and it wouldn't have made the other Guardians sound so grim while they thought Jamie was still sleeping. Tooth had told Jack to update Jamie on what had happened, and now that Baby Tooth had disappeared for a little while, and despite how much Jamie wanted to explore the workshop, there was no better time than now. Jack, he said, putting down the mechanical dragon toy he'd been looking at, and turned around. Jack was holding a Rubik's Cube with a deep frown on his face, balancing his staff on the crook of his arm while he tried to solve it. He looked up when he heard his name. Jamie, he said with an inquiring smile. Always smiling. Jamie pursed his lips. What happened back there? He asked before he could change his mind. Jack's smile melted a bit. He averted his eyes. The same expression he got when he thought no one was watching creeped onto his face. Jamie wondered if he was aware. Then he looked back at Jamie and nodded for them to continue walking. It's a bit hard to explain, he started. Jamie walked up to his side, looking up at him expectantly. Jack twirled a staff in his hand. What do you remember of the cave, Jamie? I remember the crystal, Jamie said. He frowned as he tried to recall what happened next, but the only image in his head was of the crystal, shimmering beautifully, hauntingly in the center of the cavern. There was something weird about it, right? When I looked at it, I, I think I tried to walk closer to it, but I didn't mean to. It just happened. He looked up at Jack again, silently asking if that sounded right. Jack's Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed, and he nodded. Yeah, I felt that too, he said quietly. They came to a stop by a table filled with half-finished toys that seemed to have been abandoned, and Jack sat down at the bench beside it, scooting over to make space for Jamie. He seemed hesitant. I think... No, I don't think, he sighed. I owe you an apology. That wasn't what Jamie had expected. For what? he asked. For not thinking about the consequences when I let you come with me into the cave, he said, sending Jamie a sideways look before he turned his eyes to the ceiling, to the several floors of working elves and yetis. I knew about the crystal, and I knew there was something strange about it. I should have known it could be dangerous. But I wanted to come with you, Jamie argued. It felt wrong to see Jack this dejected. That's not your fault. Jack smiled faintly, but shook his head. He took a deep breath and sighed again. When I touched the crystal, I... You were holding on to me, he explained. And after that, I honestly don't know what happened. I don't know what I saw, and... When I came back to myself, you were unconscious. He turned to Jamie, wearing an expression that was somewhat inquisitive, as if Jamie was hiding something. So we brought you back here to make sure you weren't hurt. Jamie frowned. He thought back to the conversation he'd overheard before the guardians knew he was awake, 
something about finding something? Catching air with her hands. Was there something Jack wasn't telling him? I feel fine, Jimmy said, his voice coming out a bit sharper than he intended. Jack's head jerked ever so slightly backwards in surprise, and Jamie raised his head and straightened his back. I'm stronger than I look. Jack let out a bewildered laugh. I know you are, he said. We've all seen that. The certainty in his voice made Jamie's cheeks feel warm, and he fought the smile trying to force itself onto his face. Well, you shouldn't look all sad about this, then, he mumbled, lowering his gaze again. I've been missing the adventures and all. Even though last year's was scary, it was still fun in the end. Jack was quiet for a few seconds, and Jamie looked up to see that he was smiling fondly at him. He reached over and ruffled Jamie's hair. You have a warrior's soul, he told him. That's what North would say, at least. Jamie's heart swelled. Do you really think so? I'm positive, Jack said confidently. You remind me a lot of... He trailed off. Jamie waited for him to continue, but he never did. Of who? He probed. Jack was quiet for a couple of seconds, but just as he opened his mouth to speak, someone else beat him to it. Jack! Both of them started at North's sudden, booming voice echoing from somewhere above them. Jack got to his feet and walked over to the railing, Jamie close behind. They looked up to see North leaning over the railing five floors above them. North? Jack yelled back. North's eyes snapped to them, an urgent look on his face. Did it see you? he asked. Jack frowned, looking at Jamie as if he held the answer. Jamie just shrugged. What? Jack shouted to North. The shadow. Did you see its eyes? Jack still looked confused. Uh, hold on, Jamie, he said, and kicked off the ground to fly up to where North was. But he never got that far. Jamie registered the noise before anything else. Sudden, dangerous, and so incredibly loud. Next thing he knew, the colorful workshop was flooded with debris and snow, and a shock of ice-cold air. The fourth pushed Jack onto the floor, and Jamie stumbled backwards, landing painfully on his back, his head colliding with the floor. His first coherent thought was that one of the elves must have really messed up this time. Half the workshop was torn to pieces. Yetis were shouting through the noise, running away from the gaping hole in the building. Jamie couldn't tear his eyes away from it. He tried to understand what it was he was seeing, but the longer he tried, the more he wished he could just blame it on the elves. But even they couldn't create this much destruction. There was something clawing its way into the workshop, tearing down walls and floors and thousands of toys as if it was a playhouse. Something huge, something dark, something... something... And do what? The thing looked like... like... well, it didn't look like anything. But catching it would be like trying to catch air with your hands. Suddenly, Jamie couldn't see the thing anymore, and he belatedly realized it was because Jack had jumped in front of him. In the next second, Jack lifted him up, and then they were flying. They landed on the other side of the workshop and hid behind a wall, Jack's eyes wide as he glanced back at the thing. Jack! Jamie croaked. Jack's gaze snapped back to him. He looked momentarily lost before he reached out and put his hands on Jamie's shoulders. We're gonna be fine, he told him, and though the words seemed empty when paired with his panicked eyes, Jamie found himself believing in him. Their attention was pulled away when they heard someone yelling, Bunny and Tooth, the former roaring out what sounded like a war cry. Jamie couldn't see either of them. What do we do? he hissed to Jack. They're in danger. Jack gritted his teeth, his brows furrowed as he searched for the best course of action. At least that's what Jamie hoped he was doing. But before he got the time to figure it out, his eyes snapped up at the sound of the panicked tweeting of a tooth fairy. Baby Tooth appeared in front of Jack's face, and his brows shot up to his hairline as she spoke to him. He gave a weak nod. He got to his feet and helped Jamie up as well. North has a plan, he told him, and despite it all, managed to give Jamie a reassuring smile. Follow me. Jamie wasn't able to return the smile. What is that thing? he asked, refusing to let go of Jack's hand after he'd gotten to his feet. It, it, it destroyed the... I don't know, Jack said before crouching down. We'll have to figure that out later. Come on. Climb onto my back. Jamie didn't need to be told twice. He hooked his arms around Jack's neck and his legs around his waist. Jack used one arm to hold Jamie up and the other to hold a staff in a white knuckle grip. Baby Tooth flickered back and forth in front of them, urging them to follow. Jack peeked out from their hiding place and Jamie decided he didn't want to see whether or not the coast was clear. 
He clenched his eyes shut and pressed his face into Jack's neck. Jamie knew they were flying when he felt the wind surging past them. The rumbling and crashing and the sound of the other guardians fighting came closer, as well as a chilling, howl-like sound that Jamie hoped was just the harsh wind of the North Pole and not the monster. Jamie clung tighter to Jack. His eyes snapped open in surprise when he felt a surge in his stomach and gave a choked yelp when he realized they were falling down the center of the workshop, the ground floor coming towards them at terrifying speed. But just before hitting the ground, Jack slowed down and landed with a slight stumble. Was it his imagination, or was Jack's breathing labored? Jamie had seen him perform more impressive and more dangerous feats than this before. He'd seen him get shot down from the sky by Pitch. He'd seen him and the other guardians fight against Pitch and his fearlings without breaking a sweat. Could they even break a sweat? Jamie's forehead pressed against Jack's neck. It was burning hot. But there was nothing he could do about that right now. Jack was already bolting through the room on foot, taking cover beneath the second floor of the workshop. He stopped momentarily. The entrance is blocked, he said. Baby Tooth answered with a series of frantic chirps. Jack's breaths came out in short huffs. He nodded once. I see it, he said, set into a bolt, but then had to fling himself to the side as the floor above them collapsed. Jack stumbled and tripped over a fallen beam, falling onto his side. Jamie tried catching himself, but the impact sent a shock of pain up his arm. Jamie! Jack scrambled up. Are you okay? Jack wasn't holding his staff, Jamie noted. He saw it lying a few meters away from them in the wreckage of wood and broken toys. When he looked up, he saw that they were dangerously close to the thing. He could see all the guardians except for Santa up there, fighting it the best they could. Bunny throwing exploding eggs, and the Sandman's dream sand shifting wildly from weapon to weapon. But how could they possibly win against something like that? Something that didn't seem to have a physical form. From second to second, its shape looked different than before, like flipping through a picture book. There was only one thing constant. A couple of lights. North's voice played in the back of Jamie's head. Did you see its eyes? Before he knew what he was doing, Jamie bolted forward, ignoring Jack's protests. He threw himself forward and grabbed Jack's staff before running back to him. Jack's eyes were wide with disbelief, but they didn't have time to speak. The thing had seen him. Jamie was sure of it. Jack grabbed Jamie's hand and they bolted through the rubble just as an explosion sounded behind them, right where they had just been standing. The force sent them tumbling forwards again, but Jack quickly scrambled to his feet and pulled Jamie up, making Jamie fly through the air for a second. They darted through the ruins of the workshop, half running, half floating, though Jack seemed to grow weaker by the second. Baby Tooth followed them, her chirping fast and shrill, like she was urging them on. The thing continued to wreak havoc around them, and if it hadn't been for his faith in Jack, Jamie would have thought they were done for. The hallways of the workshop twisted and turned unexpectedly, but Jack navigated easily, bringing them to a set of steep stairs. Jack wrapped his arm around Jamie's chest with one arm and hoisted him up, jumping to the base of the stairs. Not once did they look back, even as another deafening crash resonated through the building, making the walls shake. Jack pushed the door open and they burst into a chilly room. Jamie almost stopped moving upon seeing what was waiting for them inside. Hurry! Santa, no, North, urgently called from where we were sitting, behind the reins of his mighty sleigh. Of course Jamie remembered it from last Easter. He'd been dreaming about riding it ever since. What about the others? Jack asked as they ran up to the sleigh. Jack hoisted Jamie into it, but didn't immediately follow. Where's Bunny? Why aren't we using the snow globe? North didn't reply, but instead grabbed Jack and hoisted him into the sleigh as well, as if he weighed nothing. Jamie gave a yelp as North ordered his reindeer forward, and they lunged into some kind of ice tunnel. Despite it all, Jamie couldn't help a slightly hysteric laugh as he clutched onto the side of the sleigh, his stomach surging as they drove downwards. It saw you use Bunny's tunnels, North shouted over the ruckus. We cannot use that, nor the snow globe, until we are far enough away from the thing. The thing? Jack yelled back. Do you even know what it is? Th sort of, North replied. Jamie caught Jack's eye and wondered if he should be worried about how bewildered Jack looked. He calmed himself by remembering how both North and Jack operated, quick and on their feet, if not a little reckless. They'd figure it out. 
Just then, the tunnel ended and they shot into the cold open air. The North Pole shimmered beneath them and would have looked grand and majestic had it been for the thing looking like a huge storm of smoke or mist or sh shadows. It seemed to slip in and out of reality like a mirage. Only the destruction it made was evidence that whatever it was, it was very, very real. Jack jumped over to North and grabbed his shoulder. What about the others? he asked, and his voice was so hushed that Jamie almost didn't hear the way it wavered with anxiety. They are holding it back, North replied grimly. We have to get Jamie to safety first. We think it might not find us in the Tooth Palace. Baby Tooth made a sound just then, and Jamie got a feeling she just had exclaimed what Jack hissed half a second later. You think? The sound of wreckage and fighting was quickly growing faint behind them, but Jamie didn't dare look. It's a fragment, Jack, North said. Or something big. Bigger than any of us. Bigger than anything we know. It is not spirit or sprite. It is just a force that knows nothing but hunger. A fragment of what? Jack asked. Of time, North said. Ripped apart and imprisoned in crystals. Nobody has seen them in centuries. But it saw you back then. It marked you. Jack's mouth was hanging open. How are we defeated? He asked. Jamie was beginning to suspect the answer. We cannot, North said. We can only trap it again. Jack stared at him, before his eyes turned to Jamie. In his panicked state, Jamie saw the guilt in his expression as clear as day. Jack had dragged Jamie into this, was what he was thinking. Jamie was sure of it, and he hated it. But before he got to say anything, the air began to vibrate. It lasted only a quarter of a second before something crashed into the sleigh. Jamie's head knocked against the wood, his vision going white as ringing filled his ears. His hearing came back first, but none of what he heard made any sense. There was a kind of rushing and shouting and something else, something Jamie had never heard before and couldn't compare with anything else. All he knew was that it was dangerous. And then his vision came back, blurry, but even so he realized what was going on. The white terrain of the North Pole was coming closer at an alarming speed. The rushing in his ears was the wind whipping at his face and through his hair as he fell. The shouting had been Jack calling his name, but Jamie couldn't see him, and the other world he sound. Jack! he cried, flailing to turn away from the thing. He didn't want to look at it. He didn't want to see how the thing was coming closer, even faster than the ground below. He didn't want to see the two lights again, its eyes staring at him like a beast about to pounce. Instead he looked up and saw Jack, wild determination in his eyes as he shot after Jamie, holding his arms out to grab him. It was too late. Jamie knew it. He wondered if Jack did. Jack came close enough to pull Jamie into a tight embrace, but the dark flickering was all around them now. Jamie could hear something more, something other than the unexplainable sound. It sounded almost like a room full of people, talking, yelling, laughing somehow distant and near at the same time. Jack gave a desperate shout like a war cry and eyes shut from his staff. Jamie heard it crack and shatter, a gust of freezing air whipping against his neck. He closed his eyes and they fell. In these brushes with death, time seemed to pass in both slow motion and twice as fast at the same time. It was the same when Jack had witnessed Pitch Dark Arrow pierce through Sandy. It was the same when his sister had reached out to him as the ice broke under his weight. Jamie plummeted, not only towards the ground, but right into the drawers of the shadowy thing. The time fragment, as North had called it. Jack didn't have it in himself to think anything was too late. He just had to try. And then he had Jamie in his arms, but as he tried riding the wind away from the time fragment, he staggered in the air. They weren't just falling, they were being sucked into it, like a black hole. Jamie was clinging to Jack, but there was nothing Jack could do to save them. With one last desperate cry, Jack tried attacking it, but his eyes just melted into the void like water in soil. And they fell. Finally, as the howling wind of the North Pole was replaced with the same noisy silence Jack had heard when he touched the crystal, the voice in his head began to resign itself to the fact that it really was too late. What too late meant he didn't know. He realized he'd close his eyes, but light flickered around them, shining through his eyelids. 
He had a faint sense that they were moving, but he didn't know to where, nor how fast. Were they dead? Jack felt Jamie's small form in his arms, and he decided that they weren't. They couldn't be, because he had to protect Jamie. The noise came to a crescendo, and Jack tightened his hold around a small frame, because that was all he could do. A violent shudder shook his body, and even as he felt like it was burning up, he didn't let go. Whatever happened to them now, he'd never let go. And then there was cold. Jack gave a rasping gasp, stumbling forward as his feet suddenly made contact with the ground. He fell sideways, landing in soft snow. The cold was welcoming, and yet there was something different about it. Jack's eyes shut open, looking wildly around, but there was no time fragment. Only white. Jamie! he croaked, leaning back to look at him. Jamie didn't answer. His eyes were closed and his body was limp. Jack forced himself to keep calm. It helped that the same thing had happened the last time they'd encountered the time fragment. Still, Jack was quick to put his finger against Jamie's pulse. He held his breath and let it out in relief. But they were far from safe. They had to find somewhere warm and quick. The cold was biting even for Jack, getting worse by the second. But when he looked around, he didn't see the North Pole. He didn't see any sign of the time fragment, nor of anything else. At all. All he saw was a winter landscape, mostly blocked by a wall of falling snow. The wind was strong too, the snowflakes attacking Jack's eyes. He shook his head, trying to will the snowflakes out of his way. They'd never bothered him before, so why now? Was this another memory, somehow? Was he dreaming? Whatever the case, he couldn't risk writing this off as just a vivid nightmare. He tried getting to his feet, hoisting Jamie up before he picked up his staff, but he only managed to walk three steps before his body crumbled to the ground again, the world spinning around him. You're sick, Jamie's voice echoed in Jack's head. No, he muttered and pushed himself up again, bringing Jamie closer. Just then he heard the faintest chirping sound. He stopped moving and looked sluggishly around. He wasn't sure if his vision was blurry or if everything seemed hazy due to the storm. A blob of blues and greens appeared in front of him. Baby tooth, he rasped, struggling to form any words, much less a full sentence. Where? What? Baby tooth flew forward and touched Jack's cheek, and Jack closed his eyes. She chirped, but Jack couldn't understand her in this state. She sounded far away, and then her touch was gone. Jack opened his eyes and realized he'd fallen again. Baby tooth was gone. Had she ever even been there? He pulled Jamie's limp body closer, covering him as much as he could from the snow. He had to get up. He couldn't fall asleep now. He had to find shelter. It was so cold. A different cold than the one he'd felt in the dream, but close. This seemed sharper, uncontrollable, more dangerous, and if he felt it, then Jamie was in grave danger. He had to get up. He had to, but his body wouldn't move. Jamie he tried to say, but didn't know if he even made a sound. He tightened his arms around him, but he was gone. Jack's heart gave a terrified thump, and his eyes shut open, his body springing into action. Jamie! he yelled, but his voice was hoarse and weak. And then he froze. There was no snow. No biting cold. Cold, yes, but it didn't feel life-threatening anymore. Befuddled, he looked around, searching for a clue as to where he was. His first thought was that North Yetis had kidnapped him again. Maybe they'd brought him to this house or hut to hide from the time fragment. What happened to the tooth palace then? He became aware of how much his body ached. He hadn't felt this weak since Pitch had snapped staff in half, if not worse. But he ignored it for now. He had more important things to worry about. He studied his surroundings. He was lying on the floor on some type of fur, with a bunch of other fur skins discarded on the floor beside him, where he'd thrown them off himself upon waking. In front of him was a hearth, with the only traces of a fire being the faintly glowing embers in the ashes. On the other side, someone else was lying on the floor, huddled up in multiple blankets. Jamie, he said with relief. Jack crawled over to him, hesitated but then carefully placed a hand on Jamie's forehead. He was warm. A fever, perhaps, but at least he was alive. 
The fact that there had even been another possibility made Jack's stomach churn. He cursed under his breath, running a hand through his hair. What had he gotten them into? What had he gotten them into? Once again, he looked at the blankets on the floor. Unless Jack had some type of amnesia, again, and had forgotten he had talked himself into bed, someone had put him there and draped those blankets over him. Yet he didn't recognize this place at all, this... He didn't know what to call it. It was made of wood and looked old, but not decrepit. There were objects like pots and cauldrons and woven blankets in one corner, as well as different kinds of flowers and herbs stored on the tables and in the multiple wooden shelves. Did a witch live here or something? A spirit of some sort? Jack placed a hand on his forehead and let out a shaky breath. All right, he whispered to himself. Thinking out loud was easier sometimes. Weird hut. Someone I don't know brought us here. Or do I know them? Maybe it's one of North's hiding places? But... But they'd been fleeing from the time fragment. The sleigh had been knocked over and Jamie had fallen. With a painful twinge in his gut, Jack realized that he didn't know what had happened with North after the impact. And then... What had happened then? There'd been snow, and there'd been... Somehow... Cold? Jack hadn't been able to stand, much less fly. Had they ended up here because Jack was sick? Would he have been able to fly away from the time fragment if he'd had all his strength? Either way, he was here now. He'd woken up covered in fur in a creepy hut with no memory of getting there. Of course, this would happen to him. Aside from the Guardians, Jack couldn't remember any spirit who liked him enough to come to his aid. Maybe they'd done it for Jamie, though judging by the snowstorm, it was most likely some kind of winter spirit, and those were rarely so charitable. And Jamie was unconscious. It was Jack's fault. As much as he would have liked to beat himself up about that, his train of thought was suddenly interrupted by a... a what the hell was that? Jack jumped to his feet in alarm at what sounded like some kind of screech from outside. It sounded like a wild animal, but not anything Jack had ever encountered. He looked around before spotting a door at the other end of the room. Ignoring the way his body protested and begged him to lie back down, he staggered to the door and pushed it open. He expected to be met by a winter landscape, but that was not the case. Instead, the sun shone right into his eyes, momentarily blinding him. He covered his face with his hand and peeked out from underneath it. The door led out to some kind of balcony with a magnificent view of the ocean far below, notably not blocked by anything as silly as a railing. With more questions piling up in his head than answers, in fact, he didn't seem to be getting any answers at all, he inched towards the edge of the balcony to see how far from the ground they were. But before he got that far, something huge rose up in front of him, carried by the wind with massive red leathery wings. Jack only caught a glimpse of its huge yellow eyes before it was scrambling backwards in blind panic. His foot caught onto something and he fell backwards, his head colliding with something solid. His vision swam. Even so, he kept crawling backwards until his back was pressed against the wooden wall. When his vision unblurred, the dragon was gone. Was he losing it? No, he wasn't crazy. He hadn't spent 300 years in isolation, only for his mind to deteriorate now. He didn't see things that weren't there, but how could there have been a dragon? On the other hand, he'd seen things that were just as weird as a dragon, if not weirder. Hell, he was something just as weird as a dragon. People didn't believe he existed either, yet here he was. Were dragons the same? No way. No way. Jack jumped when there was a screeching sound again, but it was further away this time, coming from somewhere below him. He didn't move. He took a few deep breaths, looking up into the sky. Come on, Jack, he muttered. You've been through stranger things than this. Yetis, talking warrior rabbits, nightmare horses, the list just keeps on growing. Dragons, no big deal. He shakily pushed himself onto his knees and started crawling towards the edge. No big deal. No big deal at all. He craned his neck, peeking down. There was a village. A strange, colorful village, but Jack did not have the ability to focus on anything except the fact that it wasn't just one dragon. In fact, there were so many dragons that Jack found it weird that he hadn't heard them earlier. 
It had to do with the fact that the hut was perched extremely precariously on top of a tall mountain. The huts and the roads in the village are far below, just colorful strokes of paint. The dragon sailed on the wind over the rooftops as if the presence were as mundane as the common pigeon. What kind of spirit lived here? Not anyone that Jack had ever heard of, that was for sure. All he knew was that it had to be a spirit. No human was insane enough to build their home up here. Dragons he muttered, nodding a little to himself. He laughed incredulously, rolling away from the edge as his muscles began giving out. The adrenaline from seeing the dragon was subsiding, and now his head was throbbing, and his body felt heavier than before. But he had seen a dragon, so that was at least cool. It took him a few long seconds before he realized that this answered none of his questions. With a small jolt, he forced his aching body into action, staggering to his feet. He needed to find his staff, and he needed to wake Jamie. He needed to find out that they were safe before he could marvel about the apparent existence of dragons. Walking back inside, he hesitated before closing the door. It had been a long time since he'd felt this paranoid, but as it was, Jack's safety wasn't the only thing at stake. Jamie was still sleeping soundly. It didn't look like he had moved at all. The only thing that calmed Jack down was the faint rise and fall of his chest, almost indiscernible with all the blankets covering him. Jamie, he whispered, kneeling by his side. He placed a hand on his shoulder and jostled him gently. Jamie, wake up! Jamie! He got no reply. Jack swallowed down his fear and glanced around himself, feeling as if someone would burst into the room at any moment. Or rather than someone, one of those beasts outside. He shook his head and took a few calming breaths. Even without a staff, he had some power. It was just harder to control, maybe especially in this state. Jamie, he hissed again, but the reply he got wasn't one he expected. In fact, it wasn't from Jamie at all. A familiar tweeting sounded behind him, and Jack whipped around to see Babytooth flying into the room. Babytooth's eyes went wide. She quickly flew over to Jack, chirping so quickly Jack understood absolutely nothing. Babytooth, Jack gasped, reaching out to cup her in his hands. A relieved laugh fell out of him. You're here, I thought. Babytooth interrupted him with a frantic tweeting, and Jack tried his best to follow. Something about snow and cold, flying beasts, and the general idea that she had been worried sick. He pressed his lips together as a guilty knot started forming in his chest, but he didn't get to say anything before Baby Tooth pointed at the door, chirping incessantly. Jack understood what she meant a moment before it happened. Someone was coming. He got to his feet, hand twitching. Where's my staff? he hissed. There was a knock on the door, and Jack froze. Gothi? came a muffled voice from the other side. It was followed by something Jack didn't catch. The voice was speaking in another language. A few seconds of silence followed before there was another knock, harder this time. The voice said something more. What language is that? Jack whispered. Babytooth looked at Jack, her face tight with anxiety. She glanced from Jack to the door several times, and just as the handle turned, she did something very weird. She darted up to Jack's face and poked his forehead. Immediately, Jack was struck with a wave of dizziness, and he stumbled back a step. If he hadn't had more urgent things to think about, he would have hissed at her, but as it was, it would have to wait. The door opened. Gothi? Jack stared. The voice belonged to a boy. He was peeking into the room as if he wasn't supposed to be there. His hair was brown with red undertones and a bit lengthy. He was taller than Jack, and almost as skinny. Lanky might be a better way to describe him, and his clothes were... strange. Jack didn't know any other way to put it. A lot of it looked like it was made of leather, and were those armored shoulder pads? As peculiar as that was, the most peculiar thing about him Jack didn't see until the boy took another step into the room. A metal prosthetic starting from just under his left knee. Jack wouldn't have thought much about all of this, hadn't it been for one little detail. While this boy's strange appearance would have been unsurprising for a spirit, Jack could immediately tell that he was human. A completely ordinary human, but dressed as if he was going to some kind of costume party. Where are we, baby tooth? Jack asked. The boy turned around immediately, eyes snapping in Jack's direction. Jack stared back, unable to move a muscle. He almost thought the boy was looking directly at him. Oh, the boy started, taking a step back. 
Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to barge in. I, I, I can leave. I was just... He trailed off, scratching his cheek. I was looking for Gothi. Have you seen her? Jack couldn't find his voice. The boy was still speaking the same language as before, but somehow Jack understood him now, as if that had always been the case. However, that wasn't what had stolen away Jack's ability to speak. The boy was looking at him. He was speaking to him. Jack Frost, right? Jack found himself glancing behind himself to check if Jamie had woken up without him noticing. But Jamie was still fast asleep. Jack stared at the boy. You can see me, he croaked. The boy's brows furrowed. Uh, sorry, I don't... He started. It seemed the boy didn't understand Jack, even if Jack could understand him. Babytooth tweeted softly beside him, reminding him that the normal thing to do when being asked a question was to answer it. Weird thing was, when she made that sound, the boy didn't react at all. His eyes were focused on Jack, and Jack alone. Couldn't he see her? But he could see Jack? That didn't make any sense. Nothing made sense. He looked for a way to reply, since the boy obviously didn't understand English. And when he did, words he'd never known previously popped effortlessly into his head. I... I haven't seen her, Jack said, without knowing who he was talking about. The words were foreign in his mouth, but still he knew exactly which words to use. Babytooth tweeted approvingly. Was this her doing? It had to be. He thought about Tooth's ability to speak every existing language. Her fairies must have the same ability. What he hadn't known was that they were able to share that ability with others. The boy tilted his head to the side, obviously puzzled. He tried for a smile, looking a bit uncomfortable as he shifted his weight. I see, he said. He hesitated, his lips twitching. How do you feel? he asked. His eyes flickered to Jamie for a moment before they went back to Jack. Not good, Jack realized. His body ached, and he didn't know if the rocking of the floor was due to the way the hut was built or if it was just in his head. But the euphoria of being seen kept him upright. He just didn't understand why the boy could see him. This boy wasn't even a child. Around 18 years, Jack estimated. How did he believe in Jack Frost? All right, Jack eventually replied. Well, I guess it could be better, he added with a weak chuckle. You could also be worse, the boy said. Jack frowned and the boy waved his hands, his shoulders hunched. I mean, I'm happy you feel all right, he quickly retracted. It's just you, he pursed his lips, clearly struggling to find the right words. In the end, he just sighed and shook his head. Ah, forget it. I'm glad you've recovered so quickly. Recovered? Jack repeated, glancing at Baby Tooth. She looked worried, her eyes flickering anxiously between the two of them. Jack frowned, turning back to the boy. How did we get here? he asked. The boy's expression became somber. He folded his hands in front of himself. We found you in the snowstorm. He, he nodded at Jamie, was unconscious and you were barely conscious. I don't know if you remember because you seemed pretty out of it, so we brought you back here. He gestured around himself. This is our Gila Goth, he said. She's been nursing you back to health. As in, both of them? As in, this Gothi was able to see Jack as well? And the we suggested there might even be more people involved? How? Jack glanced at Baby Tooth for answers. She looked anxious, but there was something else there too. A look which Jack had received upon several occasions by the other guardians whenever a child was unable to see him. It was pity. Slowly, pieces began falling into place. The boy could see Jack, but he couldn't see Baby Tooth. He wasn't a child anymore, and yet he was talking to Jack as he would to any other person. Jack's body felt weak and he was in pain, even if his body usually healed within minutes. And this boy hadn't even reacted to Jack's strange appearance with his white hair and frosty clothes, as if there was nothing to react to. Are you all right? Jack looked up at the sound of the boy's voice, and all of a sudden, their eye contact didn't feel as welcome anymore. Something was wrong. Yeah, Jack said, but his voice came out weak. His legs carried him over to the corner with cauldrons and urns on their own volition. He searched the table and shelves, spotting a knife next to a bowl of some sort of chopped herbs. He picked it up. 
It was hard to see in the dim lighting, but Jack knew he would have been able to spot his snow-white locks, even in the metal's rusty reflection. Instead, a boy with brown hair stared back at him, with eyes belonging to someone who had been dead for a long, long time.